Pastor Rick. Well, good evening, everybody. Evening. You're back for another episode, another yeah. service. I'm excited to see you. You know, this has been your first time probably in a church building, I mean, this weekend, uh, in a long time. It's, it's kind of been mine also, um, uh, to preach at any rate. Um, uh, my last sermon uh, in a church building was on March the 15th in uh, Iowa, just outside of <coughs> Omaha, Nebraska, across the river. And uh, now Oklahoma opened up a few weeks ago as far as churches being able to get back together. And uh, so it's different parts, different things in different parts of the country. I have a friend up in New York, and uh, he's got a, you know, a church where many family members have been affected and so on. And so it's different, different parts of the country. But how many of you are thankful to be able to get together and see each other's smiling face and, and uh, see that everybody's alive and well and, and doing good? Let's just lift our hands and thank God for his goodness. Father, we do thank you. Uh, I thank you for this church, and I thank you for, uh, really, I believe the name, the thriving days are ahead. And Lord, we just believe that great days of harvest are ahead, and great days of growth and multiplication, and, and that, Lord, you'll be raising up many new servants and many new people to step into areas of ministry and responsibility and service toward one another. And Lord, we believe that days of fruitfulness are ahead. And so we're anticipating. Uh, Lord, you said that uh, in the last days, your spirit would be poured out upon all flesh. And we are expecting that. You said that, that the, the whole earth would be filled with the knowledge and with the glory of the Lord. And so, Father, we believe that we get the privilege of being a part of that. And so we take our place. We set our, our hearts to be in the right place at the right time and doing the right work and loving people the right way. Lord, we just anticipate great, great days ahead in Jesus' name. And everybody that agreed with that said, Amen. 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 Pastor Rick, thank you again for the privilege of being here. It's been so good and, and um, uh, just uh, thankful to have been with you this weekend. I'm not going to go over all the pictures of the books with you again. You've probably seen those. If not, um, people, they're almost gone. But we do have little plastic things on the table to show you what the books were. And uh, you can order those, and um, uh, we will pay for the shipping. And so uh, just we'd have those in the mail tomorrow or Tuesday at the latest. And so we'll get you anything that um, uh, would be helpful to you. We're going to pick up with the scripture we left off with this morning. All of these sessions kind of build on each other. But this morning we were looking at 2 Timothy chapter 4. And verse 11, where Paul made a really interesting statement, he told Timothy, he's writing from prison, and he tells Timothy, he said, get Mark and bring him with you because he's profitable or useful to me for the ministry. And we talked this morning about what a, a remarkable statement that is because a couple decades earlier, uh, Paul didn't want anything to do with Mark. Mark had failed badly. And Paul basically said, no more Mark for us. And uh, that's when he and Barnabas split paths. And, um, but aren't you glad that God is a God of second chances? Amen. How many chances would God have had to say about us? Well, I'm not going to use him anymore. I'm not going to use her anymore. How many of you had to grow through some stuff? Amen. And uh, anybody here ever have to repent along the journey and, and uh, make some corrections and some adjustments? You know, if God could only use perfect people, I'm going to tell you what, Jesus would be the only person that God could have ever used. Uh, everybody since that time has had, you know, some stuff that they've had to come through, grow through, learn through, make adjustments. And, and uh, so from Mark, we learn that you can be useful and productive for ministry work, even if you've kind of messed up or not done so great in the past. Now, um, I, I, let me tell you about a story. I, I shared that story at the end about the, the lady that stepped in and helped with that difficult baby, and uh, it enabled the mother to, you know, kind of get the word and, and uh, the spirit kind of undistracted. But let me tell you another story, because being useful for the ministry... Uh, helping your pastor is it's usually not complicated it's not complicated and we can't do it. it's usually so simple we we miss it because of how simple it is how easy it is now 
we can serve systematically, consistently in a formal position in the church. But you know, we can also just serve informally. Uh, just through relationships as we see somebody has a need and we step in to help and that type of thing. A good friend of mine who pastors a wonderful church in New Mexico, uh, when many, many years ago, his wife was saved and she was more spiritually turned on to God than he was. I think he was probably saved, but barely. Anybody here, was there ever a time in your life where you were barely saved? You know, he just, he wasn't, he, you know, he accepted Jesus, but he didn't really want to go to church and, and that type of thing. But they had a couple small children, and, and uh, she kept, you know, kind of asking, honey, let's go to church, let's go to church. He didn't really want to go to church, and finally, he said, okay, let's go to church. Where do you want to go to church? Well, I drove by this one church, the other, okay, fine, whatever, he didn't care didn't really want to go anyway. So they pull into the parking lot. And this church had a couple different buildings. And, and th this couple who's pulling, they don't know which building is which. And, and they're driving kind of slow because they know, well, I got the kids got to go somewhere. And we don't know where the adults go. And, and there's a lady uh, who is standing kind of under, what do you call the overhang? Um, the awning type thing. And... Um, She's standing there, and she's a, just a regular church member. She's not a preacher. She's not a pastor. She's just a regular lady in the church. And uh, she has uh, a baby in one arm, and she has a big diaper bag uh, with that, holding that baby. And uh, under this arm, she has a crutch because she has a broken leg. And she's just standing there. I don't know. She's probably waiting for somebody. But she sees this couple driving kind of slow. And they're kind of looking like, where do we park? Where do we go? And things like that. And, and there was a light drizzle, not a heavy rain, but there was a light drizzle. And so this lady sees this couple. Well, they're obviously new to the church. And so she hobbles out there with the baby and the diaper bag and the crutch and all that. And she leans down and says, are you new here? And they said, yeah. And she says, well, this is, this is the adult building. This is where the sanctuary is. She said, but you've got children. How old are they? And uh, they told them how old their children were. And she said, oh, you want to go to this building down here? And she says, follow me. So she goes hobbling through the parking lot and um, helps, you know, when she, she shows them where to park and uh, offers to help with the children. They say, no, no, you got your hands full. But she says, well, come in. Let me show you where. Uh, where you want to put your children, you know, the different classrooms for the different ages. And, and so she introduces them to the different workers, and the workers were just so friendly to this new mom and dad coming to church for the first time. And then she says, now there's a hallway going down to the main sanctuary. Let me walk you down there. So she walks them all the way down there. She pokes her head in the sanctuary. She says, I want to find somebody special for you to sit with. And so you know, she knows about their age, and she thinks, okay, I know. And she finds somebody who's about their age, who has kids their age. And um, she says, here, let, and she, she takes them over here and says, hey, guys, this is so-and-so. This is their first time here. Could they sit with you? And, oh, yes, thank you. And they, and, and, and just, and they talk for a couple minutes before church, and uh, right before the, the worship starts, the, uh, the couple who's been at that church for a while says, hey, could we take you and your kids out to lunch after church? And uh, they said, well, well, yeah, yeah, we can do that. So they sit down, the music starts, and the husband leans over to his wife and says, I want to come to church here. And the wife, you know, have you ever prayed, you know, God, get my husband, you know, get him excited about church and all that. And when God finally answers your prayer, you can't believe God answered your prayer. And she says, what do you mean you want to come to church here? You haven't even heard the preacher. You haven't even heard if the music is any good. He said, no, I want to come to church here. He said, if people are this friendly. And he's talking mainly about the lady with the broken leg that went out of her way. When people serve one another, there, there's a fragrance and an aroma of Christ that is released when we serve from the heart. That guy had made the decision, I want to come to church here, 
Before, now, Pastor Rick, I know we preachers, we love to think that everybody comes to church because we're so awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, many times people actually come to church. They may like us okay or like our messages okay. But, you know, sometimes people, people have different buttons that motivate them. Some people just love to worship. Some people love to fellowship. Some people love to serve. Different people, you know, you know there's some people that their favorite part of the service is the offering. Did you know there's some people, they're so giving, motivated? Not everybody's made the same. And one of the reasons that we have different passions and different desires and different interests is because God gave us different gifts and inclinations, and we serve the body with different specializations. Uh, God made us unique. And uh, so when we read this type of verse, uh, where Paul says, get Mark and bring him with you because he is useful to me for the ministry. See, that doesn't just apply to people who have high positions in the church. That doesn't just apply to people who are staff members in the church. You know, that lady, uh, she probably didn't have any title. She probably didn't have any position. That wasn't part of her job description at the church. You know what? She's just being a loving, kind caring person. She went out of her way. She went the extra mile. She went above and beyond the call of duty just to serve and welcome somebody. And, uh, and, and that serving touched that person's heart in such a way that he decided, I want to come to church here. And you know what? He got, this guy's a friend of mine, and at that time, he wasn't really all that into the things of God. But today, he's pastoring and leading people and all that. And one of the main things that brought him to a strong commitment to God, I'm not minimizing the messages, the sermons he heard over the years, because we all know that seriously, the messages are important. But many times, it's when somebody incarnates the love of God through service that people are really touched. I want to look at another scripture. We can uh, go to the screen because I believe this is our next scripture here. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Uh, we're talking about Timothy. And uh, we have that book called In Search of Timothy. Because pastors all over the country, pastors all over the world are looking for good helpers. You know, that's what it boils down to. And Paul writes to the Corinthians and says... And if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without what? Fear. Without fear. Well, why would Timothy have fear going to the Corinthian church? You shouldn't be afraid to go to church. Do you know there's some churches that are kind of scary? Yeah. The Corinthian church was a scary church. <laughs> it was the most carnal church that Paul dealt with. They had more problems than any church that Paul dealt with. <laughs> Do you know that Paul wrote some letters like to the Philippians? He just loved them. They were such good people, and, and they blessed him. They were his friends. And Paul writes them, and ah, he addresses a little problem, you know, but uh, he writes them four, four chapters. The Ephesians, six chapters. Um, you know, the Corinthians get 29 chapters. You say, why'd they get 29 chapters? Well, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And actually, from a real technical standpoint, there are two Corinthian letters that we know that were lost. And if we had those, I'm not very good at math, but that, if they were the same length, he would have written 58 chapters to them. You say, why? Well, they, they, their church was full of strife and division and they were competitive against each other. They had cliques in the church that were, you know, uh, kind of at each other's throats. Uh, the church members were suing each other. Um, they were, did you know that in the Corinthian church, they were getting drunk at communion services? Uh, at the Corinthian church, I, I hope, I can't see, I think this is an all adult crowd. Uh, they had a guy who was living, cohabiting with his stepmother. He had, he had stolen his stepmother from his dad, and they were cohabiting. And Paul said, what? 
You know, and, and, and the church was celebrating that. The church thought, we are free. You know, we're not under any bondage. The church was celebrating gross immorality and, and all that. And, and so the, the Corinthian church just had so many problems. And, um, and, and Paul said, hey, if Timothy comes, uh, don't scare him. That's what he says here. If Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear. For he does the work of the Lord as I also do. Therefore, let no one despise him. See, he knew that some of those people were likely to be hateful to Timothy uh, because Timothy was basically bringing some correction from Paul and and maybe the people didn't want to hear the correction. They didn't want to make any changes. They didn't want to make any adjustments. And so they were going to possibly be bully. They were going to bully Timothy. You say, well, why would that be an issue? Well, when you read 1 and 2 Timothy, here's one, a couple of the things you find out. Timothy was young. Do you remember that when, when Paul says, let no one despise him? Do you remember what Paul told Timothy? He said, Timothy, don't let anyone despise your youthfulness. You say, what about the issue of fear? Why would, why would Paul have to say, don't scare Timothy? See that he's, you know, that when he comes, that, that he's not afraid. Because Timothy was a little bit timid. Timothy had some, he, he, uh, we know that Paul told him, hey, Timothy, stir up the gift on the inside of you because God has not given us a spirit of fear. Timothy was prone to fear. He was a young guy who had some growing up to do. He had some maturing to do. He tended to be intimidated. He tended to be fearful. And Paul is a little bit concerned that when he sends Timothy to this church, they are going to chew him up and spit him out. You ever been to that church? Good. Glad you haven't. But this church had some kind of crude and unpleasant people in it. And then he says, uh, don't let anybody despise him, but send him on his journey in peace that he may come to me, for I'm waiting for him with the brethren. It's interesting, you know, when Paul told Timothy, Timothy, I think I'm going to need to send you to Corinth. That probably was not good news for Timothy. Do you understand what I'm saying? That would have been a hard assignment. Now, you know, I don't know about you, but if, if, if I'm going to do something, I want, I want the pastor to give me a fun job. I, I want him to give me something that's enjoyable and something that my flesh enjoys. But how many of you know that sometimes serving God involves dealing with difficult people, dealing with difficult assignments? And here's the thing that we know about Timothy is whatever Paul, this was Timothy's heart. Because Paul said, I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. See, Timothy was, his thing was, Paul, whatever you need me to do, I'm yours. I'll do whatever you need me to do to serve and to help you, the church, whatever. And if that means going to Corinth, okay, wouldn't be my most uh, enjoyable assignment, but I will do it because that's what the need of the moment is. Okay? Now I want you to know, what verses are these in 1 Corinthians chapter 16? What verses do you see listed there? 10 and 11. Now here's a spiritual examination. What comes after 10 and 11? So let's see what verse 12 is. Now concerning our brother Apollos. Now he, he, Paul brings up another guy, another minister, Pastor Rick. We talked about, you brought up a great thought about him at lunch. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren. But he was quite what? Unwilling, Unwilling to come. However, uh, at this time, however, he will come when he has a convenient time. You know, Paul is deliberately listing Timothy and talking about Timothy, and, and then he's talking about Apollos, and he's really contrasting these two individuals. 
because Timothy, Timothy had some problems. He was young and he was intimidated. But Apollos, I don't expect you to know all this, but if you study about Apollos, he was, he was an Alexandrian Jew. Timothy, his, his mother was Jewish, his father was a Gentile, which in that society caused some problems socially because, because of people's prejudices and that type of thing. But, but the, the Alexandrian Jews were very pride, uh, prideful of who they were and where they were from because Alexandria had the finest universities in the ancient world. If you are from Alexandria, it was assumed you're going to probably be really high class, highly educated, you're going to be sophisticated. And we know from studying about Apollos that he was powerful in Scripture. He was eloquent in handling the Word of God. And, and uh, not only that, but did you know that Apollos, he's named after a god? He's named after the god Apollo. I don't know, but he, I'm sure he was tall, dark, and handsome too. It just fits the scenario. Man, he was the guy who had it all together. Man, when Apollos walked into the room, everybody took note. Man, he was, he was probably the best dressed, the most distinguished, the most eloquent, the most educated, and all that. But, but Paul does an interesting contrast. He says, if Timothy comes, because Paul hadn't decided whether to send him or not, he said, if Timothy comes, don't scare him, don't despise him, and when he leaves, I, I want him to be leaving in peace. I wanted Apollos to come, but he was, what? Unwilling. Unwilling. And, but he'll come when it's convenient. convenient for him. Do you see the contrast between these two people? I'm, and I'm not trying to throw Apollos under the bus, Okay. I'm not trying to say Timothy was great and Apollos was a horrible person. Maybe Apollos didn't feel called to serve with Paul the way Timothy felt called to serve with Paul. But you see, in many cases, um, God has to use who is available and who is willing, and it's not always the person with the most talent. Sometimes individuals with the most talent don't have the best attitude. Are you with me? Yeah. And so God has to use who is available. Now, what I want to do is I, I want to share with you um, a little bit of my story because my wife and I, and we're celebrating, I did not know it was Tuesday. I'm glad I looked at the calendar. <laughs> Tuesday is my 41st anniversary with my wife. How many of you know you don't want to forget those dates? All right. So we'll be celebrating 41 years on Tuesday. Um, when we got married, I was 20 years old, and um, we moved to Tulsa. And I had been spirit-filled two whole years, but I felt called to preach. Do you remember how it was when you had been spirit-filled too? Man, you know so much when you've been spirit-filled for two years. As a matter of fact, you kind of know more than everybody, okay? When you're just freshly spirit-filled and you know you're called to the ministry. And man, back then, I know that was before you came and, and you guys came to school. But man, we had hundreds of young kids my age we were all going to be the next Billy Graham, Brother Copeland, <laughs> Brother Hagen rolled into one, man. We were all going to have worldwide ministries and, man, just, you know, uh, just the world was just waiting for us. And all we needed was a little Bible school, a little training, and, man, we were going out. And we also needed jobs. And um, <laughs> so my wife finds a, uh, a, a, in the newspaper, how many of you remember when they used to have newspapers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she found in the newspaper an advertisement from a church that needed a husband-wife janitorial team. And uh, we just had one car. We, we couldn't really go two different directions, so it was kind of an ideal thing. If, if somebody would hire us together, that would kind of solve our, our transportation problem. 
And so long story short, we made application. They hired us to be the janitors of the church. And, you know, honestly, even though I was the church janitor, my wife and I did it together, I didn't really see that as a ministry. And I should have. You know, I saw that as a job. I saw that as a way to pay bills. And, you know, it was. I mean, you know, we got a paycheck for that. And, and that's how we bought groceries and paid rent and all that while we went to Bible school. But I see, to me, ministry was what I was going to do after I got out of Bible school. Ministry was what I was going to do when I began preaching somewhere. And so what happened is I, didn't, I did not value cleaning the church toilets the way I should have. I did not value sweeping the church carpet the way I should. I saw it as a job, not as a ministry. I was going to school every morning, and my wife was too, and we were, we were learning the most amazing truths, the most phenomenal teaching, revelation, illumination, and, and just getting more. Man, I just can't wait to go to the nations and, and preach the gospel and lay hands on the sick and you know, all these things. And man, then I'm going to be in ministry. But I didn't realize I was already in ministry. See, ministry isn't just what happens behind the pulpit. Ministry is everything that happens behind the scenes. And so, it's kind of embarrassing to share this, but I, my attitude got not really good. And, um, and I, I will say this, because when I shared some of these things, my wife said, well, I don't remember. And, and what what my parents t- taught me to work hard and that type of thing. So I've never been an outwardly complaining, griping type person. But how many of you know somebody can kind of keep a, uh, their demeanor and that, but they can be critical on the inside? Oh, yeah. And so I started, um, I don't know, I, I think there were four primary things that I began sensing and um, feeling as um, a janitor. Number one, I started uh, to feel angry. Now, I've never been, you can ask my wife, my kids, I've never been an outwardly angry person. I'm not the kind of person that throws things, breaks things, yells, screams, and all that type of thing. But you know, even people that can stay calm on the outside, do you know they can simmer on the inside? Are you with me? They can, they can have a grudge and be resentful and all that, but never, never show it too much. Now, eventually it'll show up, but, but they can kind of keep it under wraps. But she, see, here's the thing. God knows the, the heart. And so I kind of got angry, and, and I got angry because I'm having to clean up after everybody. And why don't people just clean up after themselves? And why would people take gum? We had pews. Why would people take gum and stick it under the pews? You sorry, no good, you know. I mean, you start getting mad at people. And why don't you pick up that piece of paper yourself? What's, you know, what's wrong with you? And why don't you, you know, and uh, you start getting mad. See, I was, I was 20 years old, okay? And, and I should have been thankful Because as long as people are messy, you know what that is? That's job security. But I wasn't smart enough to know that. You know, I'm just a kid, so please cut me some slack and that type of thing. And then, um, you know, I started getting angry, and I kind of started getting jealous too. Um, Because other people were getting to do stuff that I didn't get to do that I wanted to do. They were getting to teach classes. They were getting to lead small groups. They were getting promoted in different areas. And I'm just cleaning the toilets and, you know, cleaning out the diaper pails. And we had a daycare, so that was wonderful. And, um, you know, cleaning up the the, the diaper pails and all that type of thing. But see, I'm wanting to go preach. I'm wanting to, I'm anointed. I'm a preacher. And and, uh, so I start, you know, why isn't anybody recognizing my calling? Why isn't anybody... You know, and see what God knew. How many of you know God's smarter than we are? Yeah. And God's way smarter on timelines and things. I needed to learn. I wanted to be a preacher, but God wanted to make sure that I became a servant. Show me somebody that gets power without a servant's heart, and I'll just show you somebody who's going to cause some damage. I, I wanted, you know, the pulpit. 
And, um, you know, it just it didn't take me long to realize that, you know, God had given Billy Graham pulpits all over the world. God had given me toilets all over the church. And I didn't like the disparity of, you know, the difference between the two. I kept hoping some prophet would come to church and uh, in the pulpit say, now there's a young man. He's out in the hallway. He's pushing the janitor's cart. Bring him in here, you know. Uh, and, you know, God has a great call upon you. Yeah, that prophet never showed up. I just had to keep cleaning toilets and that type of thing. And um, so I kind of jealous because, you know, they didn't appreciate me and I didn't get promoted. I didn't get asked to do any of the cool stuff in the church and, and that type of thing. And then I started getting critical. And, and see, the thing was, I never criticized overtly. But how many of you know you can criticize on the inside? without criticizing on the outside. Now, eventually, it'll probably come out. But I don't think I ever criticized externally. But, and, and you know what my criticism looked like? My criticism looked like this. Well, if I was in charge, if I was the pastor, I wouldn't have made that decision. I would have made this decision. If I was the pastor, I wouldn't have said it that way. I would have said it this way. Do you know how many people are experts on pastoring who've never pastored anything? I was. I was an expert, Pastor Rick. I knew everything about pastoring. Never done it, but I knew how to do it. But I'd never done it. And so I'm sitting there kind of second-guessing. You know what it means to be an armchair quarterback? I was the armchair quarterback. And then finally, I think, you know, it kind of went through that anger and then added some jealousy to it and then being critical and um, then I, I kind of stepped into a fourth level of it, and that, I call it apathy. I just say, well, you know, they don't appreciate me. I'll just do my job. I'll do the bare minimum. You know, I won't get fired. I'm not going to not do my job, but I'll just, you know, take my time, get it done. Not, I'm not going to hustle. I'm not going to go above and beyond the call of duty. I'm not going to go the extra mile. I'll just do the, I'm just going to do the bare minimum. Okay? That was kind of how I resolved myself. And um, so, uh, here I am. I'm, I'm ready to become this great preacher, but I'm flunking Servanthood 101. C totally failing Servanthood 101. And uh, here's, here's what happened. How many of you know God loves us enough to correct us? And, and it's almost like God just left me alone for a while, let me get all this stuff built up, and then all of a sudden, boom, the Holy Spirit. I, was, I, was, I remember thinking, man, I, when I become a preacher, man, I'm going to give God 100%. Man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just be passionate and zealous and do it, do it, you know, powerfully for God and that type of thing. But, you know, when it comes to being the janitor, I'll just do the bare minimum. And here's what the Holy Spirit spoke to me. This is the next slide. It says, this is, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, I want you to treat this job as though it was your ultimate calling and as though it was the most important thing you could do for me. See, God didn't want to hear about my future intentions. He wanted to see my current faithfulness. Yes. Faithfulness isn't something you promise to do someday. Faithfulness is something you do with what's in front of you right now. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. said this. He said, uh, if a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted or Beethoven composed music. He should sweep streets so well uh, that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived a great street, street sweeper who did his job well. Isn't that amazing? And so you know what happened when the Lord corrected me and I was thinking, well, I, you know, when I become a preacher, I'm going to work really hard, but right now I'm just going to slough off, do the bare minimum. He said, treat this job, treat this job as though it's your most important calling. So it's the most important thing you could do for me. Do you know what I did? When, when that conviction came to my heart, it was just, it was just, you know, the Bible talks about how the, the word of God is like a sharp two-edged sword. Boy, that just penetrated me with conviction. How many of you know there's a difference between condemnation and conviction? 
God doesn't condemn us, but he sure enough convicts us. He shines the light and shows us where we can make an adjustment. And doesn't put us down, doesn't beat us down, doesn't condemn us, but he, he brings us to that point of conviction. Do you know what? When, when the Lord spoke that to my heart by the Holy Spirit, I repented. I got my attitude right with God. I said, God, forgive me. I, I've been... You know, I've been thinking I'm going to be some preacher in the future, but I'm not even being a good janitor. And, and Lord, I need to be faithful today with what you've given me today. And man, I committed, I consecrated, I dedicated, I did all the things you're supposed to do. And you know what? I got my attitude right, and I kept my attitude right for about two weeks. <laughs> See, sometimes a person, I was in this category, sometimes a person has the, they have the sensitivity to hear a word of correction, but they don't have the maturity to process it out completely. Uh, I made the initial adjustment, but then I slipped. Anybody here ever slip back into something? You know, you commit to not doing it anymore, and then, boy, a couple weeks later, you slip back in. Old habits are bad to, hard to break. And I'm going to tell you what, the flesh doesn't die easy. If your flesh likes to gripe and complain and that type of thing, it doesn't like it when you tell it no more griping, no more complaining. How about no more self-pity? So I, I did pretty good for a couple of weeks, had a good attitude, thankful, grateful, you know, that type of thing, doing it with a servant's heart. But then, then I, I fell back into this deal and I started saying, you know, maybe the pastors made a decision I didn't like. How many of you know, the pastor's never going to be able to make a decision everybody likes, usually. Yeah. Everybody's got different opinions. If we asked right now, how many, how many of you, it's too hot in here. How many of you, it's too cold. How, it sounds too loud. Sounds too soft. You just can't, you can't please everybody all the time, Okay. So, so there's always opportunity. If we want to focus on something that we don't like, there's always something to find that if we want to be nitpicky. But you know what? There's also something that to be thankful for if we want to focus on that. Yeah. Sure, something's not perfect. We live in an imperfect world. Nothing's going to be perfect until we get to heaven. But I don't want to spend my life focusing on and griping about the imperfect. I want, well, what's good? Let's cheer that on. Let's encourage that on. So I was sitting there doing all this stuff. Well, if I was the pastor, if I was in charge, if I was the pastor. And the Holy Spirit, I believe it was the Holy Spirit, spoke something to my heart. And I, I don't know, I hope this sounds okay to you. If not, maybe I'm just misunderstanding or something. But to me, it was, he set a trap for me, for my good. He said, if you were the pastor, what kind of janitor would you want working for you? Now, you probably are smart enough to see what I did not see at the, boy, I jumped on that. I, I mean, I, I, was, I was like a fish going after that big worm, didn't see the hook there. And I said, well, if I was the pastor, now I'd have a janitor. I start thinking about if I'm in charge, man, I'm thinking about how all my different team members would be. And, and I, if I was a pastor, I'd have a janitor who showed up early because he was so excited about work. He would, he would work fast and hard and thorough. And man, he would clean the building as a ministry unto the Lord. Everything would sparkle. Everything would shine. Every, you know, and and he, he'd stay late and you know, work overtime and you know, just do everything to get the building perfect. See, I'm thinking, man, if I'm the pastor, this is the kind of janitor I want working for me. And I was finding myself getting a little bit pumped up about it. And then all of a sudden, the, that same voice, I believe it's the Holy Spirit, he didn't say, well, you're going to be the pastor, and you're going to have... No, you know what he said? He said, you be that janitor. Well, all of a sudden, I wasn't so excited anymore. Because all of a sudden, it wasn't somebody that was going to do something for me. It was me being asked to do something for somebody else. See, we all like it when somebody goes the extra mile for us, but do we want to go the extra mile for them? And, and years later, of course, I knew the golden rule, you know, about whatever you want people to do for you, do it for them. But years later, I found the, uh, the message version of Matthew 7, 12. Here is a simple rule of thumb guide for behavior. 
ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. Grab the initiative and do it for them. I, I was in a church, Pastor Rick, in New York one time, and, and the, I was talking with the guys in the sound booth. And, um, and I always appreciate those guys because, you know, you, you know the technicalities of that, and then something glitches and electronics are, can be unpredictable sometimes. And uh, the only time they get noticed is when something goes wrong, you know. But uh, so God bless you, audio, video, all you wonderful folks back there that help us see better, hear better, and that type of thing. But, but I was really impressed because this one audio tech uh, said to me, I was just talking to him about what he did because I'm not very, I don't know that stuff very good. But he just said, you know, my job is to, um, is to meet needs of the church before the pastor even knows they exist. And, and he said, you know, inevitably something goes wrong that the pastor notices. But he said, I, I want to just get everything, you know, so smooth that, you know, any problems that are going to happen, we take care of them before anybody else knows about them. See, I, I like that because it says take the initiative. Take the initiative. And so, um, so anyway, the Lord said to me, you be that kind of janitor. And so I said, okay, Lord. I, and I repented. I got my attitude right. And guess what? I kept my attitude right for another couple weeks. And then uh, a little bit later, a little bit down the road, I was in the men's restroom uh, cleaning the sink, you know, the basin, the mirrors. And I was actually, I had sprayed the, um, the, the Windex or whatever the glass cleaner is on the mirrors, was wiping it down. And all of a sudden, it just it kind of dawned on me, I'm doing my job on the outside but I'm complaining on the inside. You ever done that? Doing your job on the outside, but you're complaining about it on the inside. And um, I heard the Holy Spirit say, I want you to clean this restroom as though Jesus himself were the next person coming in here. Here I am, I'm wiping down the, the counter, the basin, the the mirror and that type of thing. And I'm thinking, what if Jesus were really the next person that was going to walk into this bathroom? How clean would I? And I thought, if Jesus was coming in, man, I, I'd have this thing spotless. There wouldn't be a water spot anywhere. And, and, and the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, it says, bond servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers. Do you know some people will only work hard when their boss is watching? And as soon as their boss leaves, their productivity and energy level drops drastically. See, the Bible says that when we work, don't just work hard when your boss is watching you work. Uh, but do your work in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Now, I would love to tell you that after those three corrections that I never, since I would have been 1981, I guess, since 1981, I've never had an attitude problem since that time. I'd like to tell you that, but I'm human, you know, things get under your skin and, you know, and, and one of the great challenges is not just to serve God with our labor and our effort and things like that, but to maintain an attitude of thankfulness and appreciation. I was in a Walmart once in um, Demopolis, Alabama, and I saw somebody wearing a t-shirt that said, I have one nerve left and you're on it. <laughs> And one reason why people have trouble sometimes serving in the body of Christ, people just irritate them, people just rub them the wrong way and all that. But, but we are called to have humility, we are called to keep good attitudes, we're called to encourage one another, to help one another, because here's the reality. If you happen to be here last night, if not, all these lessons have been building on each other. Last night we started out saying uh, this, that when God wants to do something in the earth, there are four things that happen. Number one, God raises up a leader. 
in this case, a pastor of a local church. Number two, God gives the leader an assignment. There's a mission involved. What, what is this church supposed to do? And, and much of it is, you know, just the basics of, of the, the Word of God, make disciples and reach the lost and care for the hurting and worship and fellowship and things like that. But then churches will have specific applications of some of those things to do. So God raises up a leader. He gives the leader an assignment. And then number three, you know, th all through the Bible, you see the leader panics because, God, I can't do all this. This is too big for me. This is, And so God says, I know. And that's why I'm going to be with you. And also that's why I'm going to give you a team to help you. And the Bible tells us that we are, we're not just the children of God, but we're the body of Christ. And, and we each have, just like every member of your physical body has responsibilities and things that it can do, you know. Um, and sometimes the, the most important parts of the body don't even appear to be all that exciting. You know, I, I think about this. You know, if, if you can stop and think about how important your lungs are. H have any of you been thinking about breathing or if you just... You know, we kind of just assume we're doing it and that type of thing. But think about the ability to breathe. We wouldn't be here very long if we quit breathing. I mean, it'd be very, very, very short, very limited time. But our, our, our lungs, they never get any attention. And the only time we think about our lungs is if something's not going right or, you know, something of that nature. But think about what your, the kind of things that your lungs could say to you. If you could talk to your lungs, if your lungs had a personality, if your lungs were personified, your lungs might feel like, well, I'm not very important. I wish I was some other part of the body. And, and if you could talk to your lungs, you might say, well, what, what do you want? Well, the, the mouth, the tongue, for example, man, they get to taste all kinds of great food and spaghetti and lasagna and pizza and steak and, you know, man, the, the mouth and the tongue, they get all these flavors and, and, you know, all this excitement all the time. And, and the eyes, they get to see all these different colors and sunsets and people and, you know, the, the eyes and the mouth get all this excitement. What do I do? Air in, air out, air in air out. You know, your lungs could feel kind of gypped. Your lungs could feel like they got the short end of the stick because they don't get to taste all the fun foods and see all the fun things. But how many of you know if it weren't for your lungs, your eyes aren't going to be around very long either. Not going to be tasting any food very long. Sometimes we may feel like what we do in the body of Christ, we, it's not as exciting as what the missionary does. It's not as exciting as what the pastor does. It's not as exciting about what the worship team does. But sometimes when we serve behind the scenes, when we do all the different things that all the different people do that make this church a reality, um, it, it makes the church what it is. When people give consistently, when people serve, when you invite people to church, when you express not just the love of your pastor, but when you express the love of God in your community, you're, you're, you can be like those lungs. Maybe it's not drawing a lot of attention to itself, but what you do, every part of the body of Christ is essential, valuable, and indispensable. One thing that I know Pastor Rick and I, we, we've learned this over the years, we're limited. You know, I teach. I love to teach. I think God's asked me to do that and enabled me to do that. But you know, there's a lot of things that I, I'm not very good at. I'm not a hyper-inspirational person. I'm, I'm an informational person. I can't walk on chairs like Marty Blackwelder. Yeah. <laughs> Marty's a really good friend and I love him. But you know, God, God doesn't clone people and we, we he, he contributes something that I don't have and and worship people contribute and ushers and people who work with children people who work with youth people who work in outreach and prisons and different places and you know rehab programs and all I mean all kinds of different people in the body of Christ and and you know I don't have all those gifts there's a little bit that I can do. There's, there's some things. Your pastor's very gifted, but, you know, he can't do everything. We're limited. 
And that's why God put a whole bunch of us together. And he gave us different skills, abilities, resources, gifts. And when we pull, pull them together, put them together, and begin to work together, wow, the body of Christ can be something that the devil is afraid of. I'm not sure how afraid the devil is of a sermon, maybe. I mean, yeah, I know sermons can have powerful things in it. But I'll tell you one thing I know the devil is terrified of, a unified church. Yeah. Amen. Sermons are powerful. I don't, I, I'm not trying to minimize that. But, but Satan is terrified of a unified church because that's what Jesus prayed for. Let me, let me close with this illustration because I think it illustrates so well. There's a term that I use in our Timothy book called, um, let me get the term right, uh, deficient by design. I don't have every ability in the body of Christ. I have a part. You have a part. But when you put the parts together, you get the whole. There is a lady uh, in a nursing home, retirement center. She is in the retirement center because she'd had a stroke and her body part of, you know, half of her body was badly affected by the stroke. And this lady had been a, what we would call a concert uh, pianist, uh, very classical piano player, very gifted. And because now her right side didn't work, you know, she had difficulty with mobility. Her left side was arm and leg were very strong, but her, her right side... And, and it, was, it was kind of a sad thing for her to sit at the piano in the retirement center. And uh, she used to play all these beautiful pieces, and now she could only play with one hand. She could only play with her left hand. And, uh, and she enjoyed it, but she knew it was just really a fraction of the beauty that she used to be able to produce. And one day, a, a new resident comes in, and this lady's just sitting there playing, you know, kind of with her left hand. And this other lady comes up and says, would you mind, I play the piano also, would you mind if I joined you? And she said, no, that, that'd be fine. What the first lady didn't know is that the second lady had also had a stroke. And it had affected her opposite side from the first lady. And, um, and she also had a background as a classical piano player. So the first lady sitting there just playing what she's been playing and the second lady sits down and with her right hand begins to fill in all the other parts. And all of a sudden they look at each other and realize they both were sad because they couldn't do what they wanted to do. But when, the, when you put the two of them together, they were able to do the full, you know. And it took, now it took some time because they had to learn each other's tempo and rhythm. And, I, you know, I don't know what all the te different technical things are. It took a little time, but, but once they learned to flow together, each of them contributing their part, all of a sudden the, the, the room then was filled with this magnificent music. And that's really what it is for the body of Christ. Maybe you can't do the pulpit stuff, but, but you're good at outreach, you're good at evangelism, you're good at giving, you're good at serving, you're good at inviting people to church. You know, we need people who are who are outreach oriented. We need people who are care oriented. We need people who are great prayers. And that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about being a Timothy. Timothy had different things to overcome. Paul didn't wait until Timothy was perfect before he began to use Timothy. He used Timothy even when Timothy was afraid. Even when Timothy felt intimidated, he, he just said, Timothy, just jump in and do it. And that's what I think God is saying to the body of Christ. All of you are here for a reason. All of you have potential. God didn't call us all just to be recipients, but God called us all to be contributors, called us to be servants. He called us to be people who, make, who, who, who give freely of the gifts that we have in terms of our time, our talent, and our treasure. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for, for Pastor, Tom, uh, Pastor Rick and for Pastor Leah. And thank you, Lord, so much because of your goodness and your mercy for all of us, all of our lives. And Lord, we want to thank you for the future, for the gifts that are in people right now. Lord, I believe that there are gifts on the inside of people right now that, that will be stirred up by the Holy Spirit. And they'll just begin to step out. They'll begin to serve. They'll begin to exercise these gifts. They'll begin to operate in them and be a blessing. 
Lord, may we never use our gifts to promote ourselves, but Lord, may we use our gifts to serve one another. And Lord, in that, you're going to be very, very well pleased. And I thank you for it in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, as Pastor Rick comes, let me tell you why I just called.